Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld. You're watching Back to the Bible Canada, and uh, we're doing a series on the Beatitudes, and I introduced that uh, last week. And so today I want to take us into, you know, part of or the beginning of uh, the greatest sermon ever preached, and I want to give a description of enduring joy. So let me begin by telling the story of the great English poet, Lord Byron, and Lord Byron was known as a man who was deeply unhappy. Uh, he had uh, multiple sexual affairs. Um, he was constantly desiring change in his life, not satisfied with where he was at. And he had this very fragile self-esteem. So, you know, if anything kind of, you know, made him feel unworthy, it, it just shattered him. So uh, he was all of those things. And all of that combined to create an individual, you know, deeply dissatisfied with himself and deeply dissatisfied with life in general. Uh, it was in early 1824, which was also the year of his death. Uh, he began that year with a poem which was called, On This Day I Complete My 36th Year. And it contained the following line, and let me read it. It says, My days are in yellow leaf. The flowers and fruits of love are gone. The worm, the canker, and the grief are mine alone. <laughs> now, that's a tragic ending to life. You know, beginning with promise, a man with so much giftedness, ending with so much sorrow. Now, I, I don't know how one rates happiness, on what kind of a scale you should put it on, and I'm, it's not about that today. But I, I do know that happiness and contentment is necessary for human survival. Uh, it was C.S. Lewis who said um, that conversion, he said, to Christ is an encounter with joy. Um, it was um, a, a wonderful man of God, Daniel Fuller, who uh, would often teach that to know Christ is to encounter a treasure chest of holy joy. And, and I do know that uh, the author of you know, Christian Hedonism, uh, Don, uh, John Piper, uh, would always say, you know, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. And is this ultimate satisfaction in God and in finding Him as this treasure chest of joy uh, that really does create the, the modality of Christian existence. It is the most deeply contented, uh, joy-filled, purpose-filled existence. Um, so, you know, that's where I, I, I want to begin. Um, as I begin, I'm thinking of Billy Joel's, you know, very famous song many years ago called The Piano Man. And if you know that song at all, um, you'll know that uh, The Piano Man, uh, everyone in the entire song wants to be somewhere else. They're dissatisfied with the life that they presently have. But, you know, if, if they could just write that novel, if they could just sign that real estate deal, if, if they could just get out of the military and into the life that they wanted, why, they'd really have it made. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you know, there are a lot of people that are always living with this deep sense of, if I were just able to get to that next stage, uh, I, I'd, you know, I'd really have it made. Um, I know that there are those who say, you know, I've got no regrets. And I've often thought about that in terms of my own life because, I'm in the latter half of it, and, and I know that, you know, as I look back and you say, do I have regrets? Well, you know, my perspective of my own life would be to say, uh, I believe that God was everywhere sovereign and that he was using all things for my long-term good. So even the, the deep disappointments that I felt were orchestrated by God to prepare me for the best possible eternity. But if you were to say, do I have regrets? Well, it's not about the disappointments and failures. Every regret that I have is about my own sin. I regret every sin that I have ever committed. And I wish that I had lived in such a way that I had loved God more and that I had sinned a lot less. Um, so I don't know that I can go to the end of my life saying I have no regrets outside of this, that I know that God has in this wonderful way atoned for my sin and gave me a deep contentedness and a joy that's there in Christ. Now, I'm speaking about the Sermon on the Mount and especially about the Beatitudes. And so I want to begin now and I want to talk about that the Beatitudes are the use of the word blessed and it gets used nine times in the first nine sentences of the sermon. And then it follows up the word blessed with statements 
that include statements like rejoice and be glad, it says. And so there's always this overwhelming sense that Jesus is saying, look at how happy you are now that you have this blessedness that's there in your life. So uh, most of us are aware that, that those nine blessed statements that Jesus makes have traditionally been called the Beatitudes. And there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that title, but I'll wager that most people, when asked what is a Beatitude, might not be able to tell you. And uh, so let me give you a little bit of a, a background to it. It comes from a Latin word, and it actually means blesses. Uh, and uh, the nine statements begin with the word blessed. So in that sense, it just means blessed. So we're going to ask ourselves, what does the word blessed mean? I mean, the problem that we sometimes have with words that we find in the Bible, and we actually don't find them a lot in the general society around us, they begin to take on this kind of a spiritualized meaning that we never you know, fully define to ourselves. So I'm going to stop and ask, what does the word blessed actually mean? Now, years ago, there was somebody that wrote a, you know, a book on the Beatitudes, and he called them the Be Happy Attitudes. <laughs> so the idea is, you know, this is really, it means happy, happy are. Happy are these group of people, and happy are these group of people. So it really is about Jesus' definition of what happiness is all about. So uh, is that what it's saying? Well, I, I don't think that's right. I, I think it has to do with something that's a little deeper than that. Now, if, if you watched me last time as I introduced this series on the Beatitudes, you know, I said that the nine statements that Jesus makes when he, you know, the, the, Beat, the blessed are statements, those nine statements when he makes them are not statements about how to get into the kingdom of God, but rather they are character descriptions of what people in the kingdom of God are actually like. Um, so, uh, Jesus said, look, this is how my followers actually are. This is a character description of everyone that I've touched, that I've transformed. This is what their lives look like now. And in that sense, we, we could say, wow, well, if this is what it means to be in Christ, who wouldn't want this? So, so what does it mean to be blessed? Well, for starters, uh, we know that Jesus wasn't the first one to use that word. So, for instance, David uses it in Psalm 32, where he says, Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, uh, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So, the person whose sins are forgiven, well, what is that person? That person's blessed. So, I, I, I don't think happiness quite gets it. Uh, yes, happiness is a part of it, but there's something more. And I think that more part is the word favored. Um, I want you to imagine uh, kids playing in an inner city. Uh, they come from poverty-stricken background, and they see someone who grew up in the very same environment that they are in, and they're driving through their neighborhood, and they're driving the most expensive car that they've ever seen, and they recognize, wow, that person made it. I mean, they grew up with, I want to make it like them. That person is favored, see? Uh, that's, I think, getting at the idea of blessed. When the rest of us look at the person who's blessed, we would say, ha, that person's got it made. But, uh, so, so that's, that's the idea behind it. So let me give you an illustration about that. Imagine you're engaged in a conversation. Let's say you're, you know, you're paying for your gas bill and you're waiting in line to, to pay. And uh, the person ahead of you buys a lottery ticket. And somehow, in the nature of what happens, you end up in a conversation with a person who's bought the lottery ticket. And uh, you say to them, um, why would you want to win the lottery? Now, after he gets over his shock that somebody has to have it described to them why they would want that, um, you, you recognize it's a real conversation and you begin to talk about it. And eventually the person says, well, I want to win the lottery so I could get everything I ever wanted. <laughs> so, okay, so you get everything you ever wanted. So you ask, what is it that you actually want? So the conversation begins and the person says, you know, I'd like to travel. I'd like to start a new business. 
In fact, it's the business that I've always dreamt that I could do. I, I'd, I'd like to buy a house that overlooks the ocean that's just in prime real estate and is expansive in terms of its space. Uh, I, I'd like never to spend you know, winter in Canada again. I, I'd like to go in the, wherever they want to go. And I, I'd like to quit my job and give myself to this. I mean, all of that is, if I won the lottery, if, if, if money were no longer a problem for me, I would have the things that I've always dreamed I'd have the life I've always wanted to have. I'd be in that favored position. I'm buying these tickets because I'm hoping against all hope that I could get the life of my dreams. And the word blessed is like that. See, when David says, blessed is the person whose sin is forgiven, you look at the person who has no debt before God, whose sin question has been wiped clean so that their creator, before whom they will one day give an account, no longer takes their sins into account. David says, now that would be the most favored position imaginable. I mean, the only word that we could use to describe that is the word blessed. See, the blessed has all of that behind it. It's the idea that this is the ideal life. If you had this, I mean, as we say, you'd have it made in the shade, man. I mean, that's what we're talking about. So that's what we're all about. So blessed are. So everyone wants, as you know, the ideal. They want the, the favored position. So what are the, what's the favored position of the person who's in the kingdom of God? Because Jesus has been you know, an itinerant preacher. He's been going from village to village, and uh, he's been preaching a very consistent message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I mean, God's great kingdom is about to be revealed. Uh, evil will be destroyed. And those who are in my kingdom, those who are my followers, who are under my realm, they are in the most favored position imaginable. I mean, everyone, when they find out what my followers are like, would say, man, those guys, I mean, huh, that is the blessed life. So that's what Jesus is describing for us in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So we'll take it one step at a time. And today, I want to look simply at the first two blessed statements, or what we call the first two beatitudes, or what I also call the character description of the follower of Jesus, the person to whom Jesus has become their king, to whom they bow and say, you are my Savior and my Lord. So Jesus says, verse 3 of Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So at the outset, that sounds surprising because you know, the truly favored person, I mean, the person who we say has got it made in the shade is the person maybe that's buying a, you know, a lottery ticket that's looking that money should never be an option, uh, should never be a problem anymore. I mean, we, we can't begin by saying, you know, the person that's blessed is, the person that's really favored is the person that exhibits a certain kind of poverty. So before I even talk about what it means to be poor in spirit, let's just talk about the whole issue of poverty. You see, the, the poor in the Old Testament, uh, there were laws regarding the poor. So those people who uh, had fields and land and who had crops in their field were not permitted to harvest right up to the edge of the field because everything that was on the edge was to be left for the poor. And so if you were a poor in the land, there should have been enough that falls off the tables of those who are well off so that you would also be supplied with. But here's the idea. The definition of the poor is somebody who is dependent on someone else for their needs. That is, unless someone has mercy on you, if you're poor, unless someone has mercy on you, you're not going to survive. See, this is the whole issue of poverty. Poverty puts you in a position of dependency where you're expecting somebody to care for your needs. So Jesus says there's a kind of poverty that when you've got it, I mean, it's, it's the most favored thing that can happen to you. Now, immediately we're sc scratching our heads and saying, and I'm not so sure about that. I mean, what kind of poverty could I possibly imagine out there that is a poverty that I would seek after or that I'd want or that I'd look at somebody who's got it and say, wow, look at that guy. Well, Jesus said, here's the poverty I'm speaking about. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. Oh, wow. The poor in spirit. So what are we talking about? The poor in spirit, I've, I've written it down here in my notes, are those whose spiritual condition is so bad. It's so impoverished that unless someone has mercy on them, they're going to die. See, that, that's the issue. Uh, so poverty in spirit is a part, well, I'm going to say, uh, in, in that sense, every human being is poor in spirit. Um, the, the reality is that as you read through the Scripture, the Bible tells us that there is no one righteous, no, not one, that we have all sinned, we've all broken God's commands, and that our spiritual lives are devastated, and that we are have a broken relationship between us and God so that God has become our enemy, and we are unable to save ourselves. I mean, that's the basic Bible description of our inner spiritual experience. So we might say, well, I don't know what's blessed about that because, uh, you know, the human race has it. And by the way, it, this is what describes so many of our lives, all of our lives. Our lives are characterized by brokenness. It's characterized by things are not as they should be. Um, you know, they're characterized by broken relationships that we have with others that we wish we could heal. I mean, sometimes it's characterized by marriages that have fallen apart, that have left a deep hole in our lives. Maybe it's characterized, you know, by um, uh, a parent and a child that have not been speaking sometimes in years. And it's somehow it's this, this thing that never gets healed. Or, or it can be characterized in a number of other ways, but it always comes down to one basic facet. We've disobeyed the law of God and we've borne the brunt of our failure to be in a right relationship with God. So you might say, how can Jesus say, well, blessed are the spiritually impoverished? Because, I mean, my experience has told me that's not what the spiritually impoverished are. They're not blessed. There's something on the opposite end of the spectrum. But here Jesus has, is implying something. He's implying, blessed are those who have come to realize their own spiritual poverty, that have admitted it, that have come to own it and say, yeah, that is me. In fact, if I were to describe myself, that's who I am. See, that's why Jesus would teach that prostitutes, tax collectors, by the way, tax collectors, don't think of them as tax collectors today. I mean, tax collectors in Jesus' day had basically betrayed their own nation, Israel, to the Roman authorities, had overtaxed the population so that they had personally become rich and were used as an instrument of oppression from a foreign dominating power. Tax collectors were hated. They were turncoats. They were individuals that would be willing to turn against mom and dad and all of your own people just for the sake of gain. I mean, they were considered the worst of the lot. So Jesus says, look, prostitutes, tax collectors, and all other people that were notorious sinners, had advantages of getting into the kingdom of God ahead of the Pharisees. See, in Matthew or in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus said that those who are well, or at least who think they are well, have no need of a physician. But those who are sick would come to a physician and say, I need to be healed. See, that's what Jesus is talking about. It's this, this owning of our own spiritual poverty that makes us blessed. I mean, once you've come to, to realize who it is, uh, Jesus told a parable of that, and it's described in Luke chapter 18. A Pharisee who was considered to be someone on the top of his spiritual game, admired by everyone, someone who was considered pious, someone who's considered a genuinely good person, had gone to the temple to pray. And, and beside him in the temple praying, there's another person who's praying as well, and he's a notorious sinner. And the notorious sinner, as he prays, can't even get himself to look up. He's bowed down, he's sobbing and weeping, and he all he can utter out of, you know, agonizing words are, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Pharisee who's praying next to him uh, looks over and he says, God, I I'm so thankful that I'm not like this guy. And Jesus said, but it's that guy, it's that notorious sinner that went home having been favored by God, whereas the Pharisee went home not, see, not favored by God. That, that's because at the very point in time where we deny our spiritual poverty, it is the point in time that we are most blind. 
Now, I, I want to think about that for a while because what comes to mind is a conversation I once had with a woman who approached me to say, um, you know, I, I'd like to talk to you because I used to be a Christian and I'm not now, and I'm wondering how to find my way back. Now, that got my attention. I said, Let, let's talk. A- and in the process of talking, I I knew something was wrong, and so I started to ask a bunch of questions, and as she answered some of those questions, I realized even more was wrong, and so finally all I could think of asking her was this one question. When you described yourself in your past life as being a Christian, uh, would you have said that you were a sinner? And she said to me, of course not. And then I said, how about today? Would you describe yourself as a sinner? And she said, no. And I said to her, well, I've got really bad news for you. I don't think I can offer you anything because Jesus is the one who comes to save us from our sins. The only people he saves are ones that are overwhelmed with their spiritual poverty, with their sinfulness, with their deep sense that they've broken the law of God. If you don't sense that, Jesus has got nothing for you. I was hoping to shock her out of lethargy, but but she came to the conclusion, well, if that's it, well, I, I just don't want anything to do with Christianity. Let me read to you from the book of Revelation. And, you know, there are words of Jesus in Revelation to seven different churches. I'm going to only bring up two of them and contrast them for you. Revelation 3, 17, Jesus says something to the church in Laodicea. And here's what he says, for you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing, says Jesus, that in reality, you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I mean, can you imagine such a thing? I mean, here's a wretched, blind, naked church, and they're running around and saying, man, are we ever rich. And then in contrast to that, Here's the words of Jesus to a church in Smyrna. Revelation 2, verse 9, Jesus says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, he says, but you are rich. See, he says, I know people are persecuting you, and I know they've taken away all your wealth, but when I look at you, I see you as profoundly wealthy. See, the contrast is the person that says, man, I... I, I don't need anything. I'm not a sinner. I don't need the rescuing of God. And the other person that says, you know, I got nothing to offer. I'm overwhelmed when I think about the law of God that I've broken and the fact that if I were to encounter God today, I know it would not go well with me. And if that's you, says Jesus, if you've become aware of the impoverished spiritual nature of your condition. You are in the most favored position imaginable. I mean, you got to think about it because yours, he says, is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven belongs to that kind of a person. And what you inherit is the wealth of heaven. And the only person that inherits this is that. So if you want to walk around and you say, who's in the most favored position imaginable? That's the one. Oh, Now, having said that, I mean, Jesus, of course, is not done because here's the deal. You know, awareness of our own spiritual poverty might not be enough. Yeah, it's a necessary condition, but it's it's not a sufficient condition. See, awareness of spiritual poverty, um, you know, is, is, is not all that you need. And so Jesus adds the second beatitude, And here it is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So again, we have a blessed statement. Here's the person in the most favored position imaginable. It's the person who's weeping and mourning. Now, please don't read these as separate statements, but as a part of a cumulative argument that Jesus is making. You you, you understand what I'm saying. Um, So, If you read it as a separate statement, you might say, well, people, the the most blessed people in the world are people who are crying all the time. And I need you to know something about this world. This world is constantly in mourning. 
I mean, every single day there are millions of people who die. It's just a part of living in a cursed creation. People are dying. I've, I've uh, often made a mention of this, that at the end of every year, the amount of people that will have died on this earth at every year is you know, the approximate population of the UK. You want to think about that. Every year, uh, the, the, the population of the UK passes from the scene and there are people left behind who cry out in bitter mourning and the sense of loss and are crushed by the grief of death. But it's not just the people that have lost loved ones. It's, it's the people that encounter crippling disease every day, the people that see a financial misfortune every single day that reduces them to poverty and weep over the change of status that they once had, the people whose marriages break up every single day, the people who go through you know, great illness every single day, and the people that walk through uh, being shut out of their culture and society and becoming the object of hatred of others, this happens every single day. And what I'm trying to say is that if we could put together the cumulative total of the cries that go out from this earth every single day, we'd be astonished and shocked. It should fill our newspapers and say, oh my, this world simply is a world of unrelenting grief. So if all Jesus was saying is blessed are those who mourn, he wouldn't be saying much because even if you're not mourning today, I say to you who are watching me, if you're not mourning today, let me say this to you. There will be a day that will come very soon when you will be in mourning. You'll not escape this. You will not. So if all Jesus were saying is blessed are those who are weeping, it wouldn't be saying a lot. But Jesus is referring to already the mourning over our spiritual condition. I already recognize that I am poor in spirit, but I also recognize that I'm, in, I'm in, in mourning over this. Now, when I say this, let me read to you from what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. He says, godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Worldly grief produces death. Now, there's a kind of grieving that does no good whatsoever. In other words, I mean, there are people that, you know, they weep over the consequences of their sin. I mean, if you want an example of that, I mean, you want to think of the person um, who's perhaps, you know, the, the powerful man who's abusing women and, um, you know, everything looks good until he's finally discovered to be the dastardly individual that he is. Uh, and then he begins to mourn and weep. And he's not weeping because of his sin, but he's weeping because of the consequences of his sin. It's so devastating now, he's overwhelmed with sorrow, but that's a worldly sorrow and it only leads to death. There's no benefit in that kind of mourning whatsoever. But there's another kind of mourning which deeply mourns over the loss of our condition before God. I recognize I'm spiritually impoverished because I've broken God's law. And I've come to recognize who God is. And I've come to recognize that a broken relationship with God is the worst possible thing that could happen. And therefore, I mourn over my sin, not so much because of the consequences of the sin, but because I hate the sin itself. How is it that this sin has ruled over me so that the mourning leads me to this renunciation of the sin? I don't want it anymore. I'm deeply grieved over my attitude towards God and the loss that it has created. And I want so desperately for that deep spiritual poverty that I know to be healed and to be replaced by something else. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn like that because I promise you they shall be comforted. Well, you know, uh, I want to end by just telling, a, I know it's a negative story, but I just feel like I need to tell it. I remember years ago hearing a woman who uh, claimed to have come to Christ uh, out of a cult. And, um, and uh, she, she said, I, I want to give my testimony, my story. So there are a couple of gathered in a home and just listened to her give her story. And her story went something like this. Uh, my father was an abuser. He was a terrible man, but I decided I was going to live for God. 
And then she said, my sister abused me terribly, but I decided I'd live for God. And then I had a husband, um, um, you know, he treated me badly, and I decided I'd live for God. And by the time she was finished her story, everyone else in her story had become, you know, they were a villain, but she was the hero of the story. And I want to tell you this, if you talk about your spiritual story and you're the hero of your story, you are not a person that is in a favored position at all, at all, at all. I, you're in a horrible situation. You have no idea how wretched you actually are. But if you tell your own story and say, I have nothing to commend myself before God, I offer him nothing, I've done nothing that he owes me anything. In fact, all I've done is sin against his majesty. And I have come to realize that's despicable. And I mourn, for I want the Savior to take this sin from me and to cleanse me from that. And if that's you, says Jesus, if you've become that, I'm going to tell you something. You're in the most favored position imaginable. The person that's won the lottery is poverty-stricken next to you. You are the individual that has stood in the place of the greatest contentment that can be found in the human race. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they have found contentment in God. Thanks for watching Back to the Bible Canada today. May the Lord bless you on this day. God bless you. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.